Hello, everybody, and welcome to Storytime. We are reading The Iliad, translated by Robert Fagels. We're on book 18, The Shield of Achilles. And if you're just now tuning in for the first time, for some reason, and you happen to be an expert in Greek history or poetry or speak Greek or have heard Greek spoken at all, you might notice that my pronunciations are a little bit off. I apologize for that. Um, well, without further ado, Book 18, The Shield of Achilles. So the men fought on like a map. No, actually, hold on. Wait, wait, where are we? Let's let's set our It's been a hot minute. I can't remember what just happened. All right. Previously on the Iliad. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Menelaus. Uh, what's the other dude's name? What's, um... No, 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 other one, other one. Patroclus fights and dies. Right. So Patroclus is Achilles' sidekick. Not a sidekick, but you know. His friend, close friend, companion, warrior. Achilles is having his, uh his bout of fate um bout of doubt the whole premise of this is that you know achilles has been kind of screwed over by agamemnon <clears throat> and uh so achilles hasn't been fighting patroclus comes and says well i'm gonna take your armor and i'm gonna dress as you and i'm gonna go kick some ass in your name and he's like cool bro just don't get too close to that wall right you just you beat him off from the ships and we're good and Patroclus goes and beats them off from the ships. And then is like, well, I mean, I could chase them to the walls a little bit. And gets ganked, as we would say in the modern term. Uh, and then there is a battle. Where Menelaus and a bunch of other people join in. And I th they recover Patroclus' body, I think. Menelaus' finest hour. I think that's what happened in the last chapter. It's been a hot minute. Great Telamonian Ajax answered firmly. All true, straight to the point, Lord Menelaus. Quickly, you and Moroni's shoulder up the body, carried off the lines. Yeah, we're right behind you, fighting the Trojans, fighting this Prince Hector. That might be someone else's body, but I think that's more or less what happened. Shields up, weapons online. Okay. Yeah, it's always firm with you, Ajax. The end of the last chapter was flying before them now like clouds of crows or starlings screaming murder, seeing a falcon dive in for the kill, the hawk that wings grim death at smaller birds, so pursued by an and then you and Hector Argive fighters raced screaming death cries, lust for battle, and masses of fine armor littered both sides of the trench as the Argives fled in fear. No halt in the fighting. Not now. Book 18, The Shield of Achilles. So the men fought on like a mass of whirling fire. So swift Antilochus raced the message toward Achilles. Sheltering under his curving beaked ships, he found him foreboding deep down all that had come to pass. Agonizing now, he probed his own great heart. Why? Why? Our long-haired Achaeans routed again, driven off, or driven in terror off the plains to crowd the ships? But why, dear gods, don't bring to pass the grief that haunts my heart, the prophecy that Mother revealed to me one time? She said the best of the Myrmidons, while I lived, would fall at the hands of Trojans and leave the light of day. And now he's dead. I know it. Minotius' gallant son, my headstrong friend, and I told Patroclus clearly. Once you have beaten off the lethal fire, quick, come back to the ships. You must not battle Hector. 
As such fears went churning through his mind, the warlord Nestor's son drew near him now, streaming warm tears to give the dreaded message. Ah, oh, son of royal Pleus, what you must hear from me, what painful news, would to God it had never happened. Turn down the music just a touch, it's a little loud. Would to God it had never happened. Patroclus has fallen. They're fighting over his corpse. He's stripped, naked. Hector with that flashing helmet. Hector has your arms! So the captain reported. A black cloud of grief came shrouding over Achilles. Both hands clawing the ground for soot and filth. He poured it over his head, fouled his handsome face, and black ashes settled onto his fresh, clean war shirt. Overpowered in all his power, sprawled in the dust, Achilles lay there, fallen, tearing his hair, defiling it with his own hands. And the woman he and Patroclus carried off as captives caught the grief in their hearts and knelt and wailed out of the tents as they ran to wring the great Achilles. All of them beat their breasts with clenched fists, sank to the ground. Each woman's knees gave way. Antilochus, kneeling near, weeping uncontrollably, clutched Achilles' hand as he wept his proud heart out for fear he would slash his throat with an iron blade. Achilles suddenly loosed a terrible, wrenching cry, and his noble mother heard him, seated near her father, the old man of the sea in the salt green depths, and she cried out in turn. And immortal sea nymphs gathered round their sister, all the Nereids dwelling down the sounding depths. They all came rushing now, glitter, blossoming spray, and the swells embrace. Fair isle and shadowy cavern, mist and spindrift, ocean nymphs of the glancing pools deep and dark, race with waves and, headlo and headlands hope and safe haven, glimmer of honey, suave and soothing, whirlpool, brilliance, bounty, and first light and speeder of ships and buoyant power, welcome home and bather's meadow and master's lovely consort. These are all names. Gifts of the sea, eyes of the world, and the milk and the famous milk white cla calm and truth and never wrong, and the queen who rules the tides in beauty, and in rushing and in rushed glory to healer of men, and the one who rescues kings, and sparkler down from the cliffs, sleek haired strands of sand, and all the rest of the Nereids dwelling down in the depths. The silver cave was shimmering full of sea nymphs, all in one mounting chorus, beating their breasts as, as Thetis lynched their dirge. Hear me, sis, launched their, the dirge. <clears throat> Hear me, sisters, daughters of Nereus, so you all will know it well. Listen to my sorrows welling in my heart. I am in agony, mother of grief and greatness. Oh, my child. Yes, I gave birth to a flawless, mighty son, the splendor of heroes. And he shot up like a young branch, like a fine tree. I reared him, the ocean's crowning glory but only to set, send him off in the beaked ships to Troy, to battle Trojans. Never again will I embrace him, striding home through the doors of Peleus's house. As long as I have him with me, still alive, looking into the sunlight, he is racked with anguish. And I, I go to his side. Nothing I do can help him. Nothing. But go I shall, to see my darling boy, to hear what grief has come to break his heart while, his, while he holds back from battle. So Thetis cried as she left the cave, and her sisters swam up with her, all in a tide of tears, all billowing around them now. The ground swell heaved open, and once they reached the fertile land of Troy, and they all streamed ashore, row on row in large courtage, a sea, uh, the sea nymphs filing up where the Myrmidon ships lay hulled, clustered closely round the great runner Achilles. As he groaned from the depths, his mother rose before him, and a sobbing sharp cry cradled her son's hand, head in her hands, and her words were all compassion, winging pity. My child, 
Why in tears? What sorrow has touched your heart? Tell me, please, don't harbor it deep inside you. Zeus has accomplished everything you wanted. Just as you raised your hands and prayed that day, all the sons of Achaea are pinned against the ships, and all for want of you. They, share shuffer, they suffer shattering losses. And groaning deeply, the matchless runner answered, Oh, dear mother, true, all those burning desires Olympian Zeus has brought to pass for me. But what joy to me now. My dear comrades dead, Patroclus, the man I loved beyond all other comrades, loved as my own life. I've lost him. Hector's killed him. Stripped the gigantic armor off his back, a marvel to behold my burnished gear. Radiant gifts the gods presented Peleus the day they drove you into a, mortal marriage's a mortal's marriage bed. I wish you'd lingered deep with the deathless sea nymphs, lived at ease, and Peleus carried home mortal bride. But now as it is, sorrows, unending sorrows must surge within your heart as well. For your own son's death, never again will you embrace him striding home. My spirit rebels. I've lost the will to live, to take my stand in the world of men. Unless, before all else, Hector's battered down by my spear and grasps away his life. The blood price for Patroclus, Menoetius's gallant son, he's killed and stripped. But Thetius answered, warning through her tears, You're doomed to a short life, my son, for um, all you say. You for hard on the heels of Hector's death, and your death must come at once. Then let me die at once, Achilles burst out, despairing, since it was not my fate to save my desert caught my dearest comrade from death. Look, a world away from his fatherland, he's perished, lacking me, my fighting strength to defend him. But now, since I shall not return to my fatherland, nor did I bring one ray of hope to my Patroclus, nor to the rest of my steadfast comrades, countless ranks struck down by the mighty Hector. No, no. Here I sit by the ships, a useless, dead weight on the good green earth. I, no man my equal among the bronzed armed Achaeans, not only in battle, only in wars of words that others win. If only strife could die from the lives of gods and men, and anger that drives the sanest man to flare in outrage. Bitter gall, sweeter than the dripping streams of honey that swore forms the people's chest and binds like smoke, just like the anger Ag Agamemnon, king of men, has roused within me now. Enough. <laughs> Let bygones be bygones. Done is done. Despite my anguish, I will beat it down, the fury mounting inside me, down by force. But now I'll go and meet that murderer head on, that Hector who destroyed the dearest life I know. For my own death, I'll meet it freely whenever Zeus and the other deathless gods would like to bring it on. Not even Heracles fled his death. For all his power, favorite son as he was to father Zeus the king, fate crushed him, and Hera's savage anger. And I too, if the same fate waits for me, I'll lie in peace once I've gone down to death. But now, for the moment, let me seize great glory and drive some woman of Troy or deep breasted Dardan to claw with both hands at her tender cheeks and wipe away her burning tears and sobs come choking from her throat. They'll learn that I refrain from war a good long time. Don't try to hold me back from fighting, mother. Love me as you do. You can't persuade me now. Oh, what a speech. The goddess of the glistening feet <laughs> replied... <laughs> <laughs> yes, my son, you're right. No coward's work to save your exhausted friends from headlong death. But your own handsome war gear lies in Trojan hands, bronzed and burnished. And Hector in that flashing helmet, Hector glories in your armor, strapped across his back. Not that he will glory in it long, I tell you. His own destruction hovers near him now. 
wait. Don't fling yourself in the grind of battle yet. Not till you see me coming back with your own eyes. Tomorrow, I will return to you with the rising sun, bearing splendid arms from Hephaestus, god of fire. With that vow, she turned away from her son and faced the ur- uh, and faced and urged her sisters of the deep. And now you go into the ocean's folding gulfs to visit father's halls, the old man of the sea, and tell him all. I am on my way to Olympus Heights, to the famous smith Hephaestus. I pray he'll give me uh, my son some fabulous armor full of a great god's fire. And under a foaming wave, her sisters dove as glistening-footed Thetius soared towards Olympus to win her dear son an immortal set of arms. And now... As her feet swept her toward Olympus, ranks of Achaeans, fleeing man-killing Hector with a grim, unearthly cries, reached the ships and the Hellespont's long shore. As for Patroclus, there seemed no hope that Achaeans could drag the corpse of Achilles' comrade out of range. Again, the Trojan troops and teams overtook the body with Hector, son of Priam, storming fierce and fire. Three times the illustrious Hector shouted for support, seized his feet from behind, wild to drag him off. Three times the ANTs, armed in battle fury, fought the corpse off him. Fought him off the corpse. But Hector held firm, stalking all of his massive fighting strength, Again and again he hurled himself at the melee, again and again steadfast with piercing cries, but he never gave ground backward, not one inch. The helmed Anentes could no more frighten Hector, the proud son of Priam, back from Patroclus's corpse than shepherds out in the field can scare a tawny lion or kill or a tawny lion off his kill when the hunger drives the beast claw mad. And now Hector would have hauled the body away and won undying glory if swift wind Iris had not swept from Olympus bearing her message. Peleus' son must arm, but all unknown to Zeus and the other gods since Hera spurred her on. Halting near, she gave Achilles a flight of marching orders to arms, son of Peleus. Most terrifying man alive. Defend Patroclus. It's all for him. This merciless battle pitched before the ships. They're mauling each other now. Achaean struggling to save the corpse from harm. Trojans charging to haul it back to windy Troy. Flashing Hector's far in the lead. Wild to drag it off. Furious to lop the head from its soft tender neck and stake it high on the city's palisade. Up with you. No more lying low. Writhe with shame at the thought Patroclus may be sport for the dogs of Troy. Yours? The shame will be yours if your comrade's corpse goes down in the field. But the swift runner replied, Immortal Iris, what god has sped you here to tell me this? Quick as the wind, the rushing Iris answered, Hera winged me on, the illustrious wife of Zeus, but the son of Kronos, throned on high, knows nothing, nor does any another immortal house on Olympus shrouded deep in snow. Achilles broke in quickly, How can I go to war? The Trojans have my gear, and my dear mother told me I must not arm for battle till not till I see her coming back with my own eyes. She vowed to bring me burnished arms from the god of fire. I know of no other armor. Whose gear would I wear? None but tell Telemonian Ajax's giant shield, but he's at the front, I'm sure, engaging Trojans, slashing his spear to save Patroclus' body. Quick as the wind, the goddess had a plan. We know, we too, they hold your famous armor. Still, ju- go just as you are, go out to the broad trench and show yourself to the Trojans. Struck with fear at the sight of you, they'll hold off from attack, and Achaea's fighting sons get second wind, exhausted as they are. Breathing room in war is all too brief. Hold on. Okay, I don't need to pay attention to that. Sorry for the short 
break in the story time? Just a quick finagle. Excellent. Okay. I'm sure this is going to be great, right? Mm hmm. Struck with fear at the side of you, they must hold off from attack. And Akia's fighting sons will get a second wind exhausted. They are breathing room in war is all too brief. And Iris racing the wind went veering off as Achilles, Zeus's favorite fighter, rose up now and over his powerful shoulder, Pallas slung the shield, the tremendous storm shield with all its tassels flaring. And crowning his head, the goddess swept a golden crown, and from it she lit a fire to blaze across the field. As smoke goes towering up the sky, from out a town cut off on a distant island under siege, enemies battling round it, defenders all day long, trading desperate blows from their own city walls. But soon as the sun goes down, the signal fires flash, Rows of beacons blazing into the air to alert the neighbors. If only they'll come in ships to save them from disaster. So for our, so now from Achilles' head, the blaze shot up the sky. He strode from the rampart, took his stand at the trench, but would not mix with the milling Argive ranks. He stood in awe of his mother's strict command. So there he rose and loosed an enormous cry, and off in the distance Pallas shrieked out too and drove unearthly panic through the Trojans. Piercing loud as the trumpet's battle cry that blasts from murderous raiding armies ringed around some city, so piercing now the cry that broke from Achilles. From Aesides? Uh, and Trojans, hearing the brazen voice of Aesides, all their spirits quaked. Even sleek maned horses, sensing death in the wind, flew their chariots round their charioteers, were struck dumb when they saw that fire. Relentless. Terrible, burst from proud-hearted Achilles' head, blazing as fire-eyed Athena fueled the flames. Three times the brilliant Achilles gave his great war cry over the trench. Three times the Trojans and their famous allies whirled in panic. The twelfth, the twelve of their finest fires, d fighters died then and there, crushed by chariots, impaled on their own spears, and now... The exultant Argives seized the chance to drag Patroclus's body back out of range and laid him on a litter. Surround standing round him, loving comrades mourned. The swift runner Achilles joined them, grieving, weeping warm tears when he saw his steadfast comrade lying dead on the byre, mauled by tearing bronze, the man he sent to war with a team and a chariot, but never welcomed home alive again. Now Hera, the oxen-eyed queen of heaven, drove the sun, untired and all unwilling to sink into the ocean's depths, and the sun went down at last, and brave Achaean ceased the grueling clash of arms and leveling rout of war. And the Trojans in turn, far across the field, pulling forces back from the last rough assault, feet uh, freed their racing teams from under chariot yokes, but before they thought of supper, Grouped for council, the me they met on their feet. Not one of them dared to sit, for terror seized them all. And the great Achilles, who held back from the brutal fray so long, had just come blazing forth. Panthalosus's son, Polydamus, led the debate. 
a good clear head and the only man who saw what lay in the past and what the Trojans faced. He was Hector's close comrade, born on the same night, but excelled at trading words as he traded spear thrusts. And now, with all good will, Polydamus rose and spoke. Way both sides of the crisis well, my friends. What I urge is this. Draw back to the city now. Don't wait for the holy dawn to find us here afield, ranged by the ships. We're too far from our walls. As long as that man kept raging at loyal at Royal Agamemnon, the Argive troops were easier game to battle down. I too was glad to camp the night on the shipways, hopes soaring to seize their heavy rolling hulls. But now racing Achilles makes my own blood run cold. So wild the man's fury, he will never rest content. Holding out on the plain where Trojans and Argives met halfway, exchanging blows in the savage onset, never. He will fight for our wives, for Troy itself. So retreat to Troy. Trust me, we will face disaster. Now, for the moment... The bracing godsend knight has stopped the swift Achilles in his tracks. But let him catch us lingering here tomorrow. Just as he rises up in arms, there may be some who will sense his fighting spirit all too well. You'll thank your stars to get back to sacred Troy. Whoever escapes him. Dogs and birds will have their fill of Trojan flesh by heaven. Battalions of Trojans. Pray God such grief will never reach my ears. So, so follow my advice, hard as it may seem. Tonight can serve our strength in the meeting place. And the great walls and gates and timbered doors we hung, well planned, massive, and bolted tight, will shield the city. But tomorrow at daybreak, armed to the hilt for battle, we man the towering ramparts, all the worse for him. If Achilles wants to venture forth from the fleet, fight us round our walls, back to the ships he'll go, once he's lashed the power out of his rippling stallions, whipping them back and forth beneath our city walls. Not even his fury will let him crash our gates. He'll never plunder Troy. Sooner the racing dogs will eat him raw. Helmet flashing, Hector wheeled with a dark glance. No more, Polydramas. Your pleading repels me now. You say go back again? Be crammed inside the city? Aren't you sick of being caged inside those walls? Time was when world would talk if Priam's Troy as the city rich in gold and rich in bronze. But now our houses are stripped of all their sumptuous treasures. Trove sold off and shipped to Figira. Lovely Maonia, once great Zeus grew angry. But now, the moment the son of Cooked Kronos allows me... Crooked Kronos allows me to seize some glory here at the ships and pin these Argives back against the sea? You fool! Enough! No more thoughts of retreat paraded before our people. Not the one Trojan, not that one Trojan will ever take your lead. I'll never permit it. Come, follow my orders. All obey me now. Take supper now. Take your post through camp. And no forgetting the watch. Each man wide awake. And any Trojan so weighed down, so oppressed by his possessions, let him collect the lot, pass them round to the people, a grand public feast. Fair, far better for one of ours to reap the benefits than all the marauding Argives. Then, as you say, tomorrow at daybreak, armed to the hilt for battle, we'll slash to attack against their deep curved hulls. If it really was Achilles who reared beside the ships, all the worse for him. If he wants his fill of war, I, for one, I'll never run from his grim assault. I'll stand to the man, see if he bears off glory or I bear it off myself. The god of war is impartial. He hands out death to the man who hands out death. So Hector finished. The Trojans roared assent, lost in folly. Athena had swept away their senses. They gave applause to Hector's ruinous tactics, none to Polydamus, who gave them sound advice. And now the entire army settled down to supper. 
But all night long, the Argives raised Patroclus's dirge, and Achilles led them now in a throbbing chant of sorrow, laying his man-killing hands on his friend's on his great friend's chest, convulsed with bursts of grief, like a bearded lion whose pride of cubs and a deer hunter has snatched away out of some thick woods, and back he comes, too late, and his heart breaks, but he courses after the hunter, hot on his tracks down, glean with a Glee, twisting glen where can he find him gripped by piercing rage so achilles groaned deeply crying out to his myrmidons oh my captains how empty the promise i let fall that day i reassured Men menotius in his house i promised the king i'd bring him back his son home to opoios covered in glory Tro troy sacked hauling his rightful share of the plunder home Oh, but Zeus will never accomplish all our best laid plans. Look at us, both doomed to stain red with our blood, the same plot of Earth, a world away in Troy. Not, for not even I will voyage home again. Never. Not embrace in his halls from the hold horseman Peleus, nor from my mother, Theseus, this alien Earth I stride will hold me down at last. But now, Trochilus. Since I will follow you underneath the earth, I shall not bury you, no, not till I drag you back here, the gear and the head of Hector who slaughtered you, my friend, great-hearted friend, here! In front of your flaming pyre, I'll cut the throats of a dozen sons of Troy in all their shining glory, venting my rage on them for your destruction. Then you lie as you are beside my beak ships, and round the Trojan women in deep-breasted dardens will mourn you night and day, weeping burning tears, women we fought to win, strong hands and heavy lance, whatever we sacked rich cities held by mortal men. With that, the brilliant Achilles ordered friends to set a large three-legged cauldron over the fire and wash the clotted blood from Patroclus' wounds with all good speed. Hoisting over a blaze a cauldron, filling it with uh, it brimful with bathing water, they piled fresh logs beneath and lit them quickly. The fire lapped at the vessel's belly. The water warmed, and soon it reached the boil and the glowing bronze. They bathed and anointed the body with sleek, body sleek with olive oil. Closed each wound with a soothing, seasoned, urgent. And then they laid Patroclus on his bier, covered him head to foot in a thin light sheet, and over his body spread the white linen shroud. Then all night long, ringing the great runner Achilles, Myrmidon fighters mourned and raised Patroclus's dirge. But Zeus turned to Hera, his wife and sister, saying, So, my ox-eyed queen, you have had your way at last, the famous Achilles, setting the famous runner Achilles on his feet. Mother Hera, look, these long-haired Achaeans must sprung, be sprung of your own immortal loins. But her eyes widening, noble Hera answered, Dread majesty, son of Cronus, why are you saying that? Even a mortal man will act to help a friend, condemned as a mortal always is to death, and hardly endowed with wisdom deep as ours. So how could I, claiming to be the highest goddess, both by birth and and since I am called your consort, and you in turn rule all the immortal gods, how could I hold back from these, these Trojans, men I loathe, I fail to weave their ruin, and fail to weave their ruin. Now, as the king and queen provoked each other, glistening-footed Theseus reached Hephaestus's house, indestructible, bright as stars, shining among the gods, built of bronze by the crippled smiths with his own hands. There she found him, sweating, wheeling round his bellows, pressing the work on twenty-three-legged cauldrons. On twenty-three-legged cauldrons, not on a twenty-three-legged cauldron. Ah, uh -huh. An array to ring the walls inside his mansion. He'd bolted golden wheels to the legs of each so they'd all 
So all on their speed and nod from him, they like could roll to the halls where the gods convene and roll home again, a marvel to behold, but not quite finished yet. The gods still had to attach the inlaid handles. These he was just fitting, belting in the rivets, as he bent the work with all his craft and cunning. Thetis on her glistening feet drew near the smith, but Charis saw her first, Charis coming forward, lithe and lovely in all her glittering headdress, and grace the illusion illustrious crippled smith had married <clears throat> the grace the illustrious crippled smith had married approaching Thedius, she caught her hand and spoke her name Thedius of flowing robes what brings you to our house a oh, beloved honored friend it's been so long your visit's much too rare Follow me in, please. Let me offer you uh, all a guest could want. Welcome words, the ra uh, welcome words, and the radiant goddess Charis led the way inside. She seated on, she seated her on a handsome, well wrought chair studded with silver. Under it st slipped a stool, and called the famous smith Hephaestus. Come, look who's here. Thetis would ask a favor of you, and the famous crippled smith exclaimed warmly, Thetis. Here? Ah, oh, then a wondrous honored goddess comes to grace our house. Thetis saved my life when the mortal pain came on me after my great fall. Thanks to my mother's will, that brazen bitch, she wanted to hide me because I was a cripple. What shattering anguish I'd suffered then if Thetis had not taken me to her breast. Euronomy, Euronomy too, the daughter of the ocean stream that runs around the world. Nine years I lived with both. Forging bronze by the trove, elegant brooches, world pins, necklaces, chokers, chains. There in that vaulted cave, and round us ocean's currents swirled in a foaming, rushing, uh, roaring rush that never died. And no one knew, not a single god or mortal, only Thetis and Euronymy, your own, your own, your own knew. They saved me. And here's Thetis now, in our own house, so I must do all I can to pay her back for the the price for the life she's saved. The nymph of the sea with sleek, illustrious locks. Quick, set before the stranger's generous fare while I put away my bellows and all my tools. With that, he heaved up from the anvil block, his immense hulk hobbling along by his shrunken legs moving nimbly. He swung the bellows aside and off the fires, gathered the tools he'd used to wield the, weld the cauldrons and packed them all in sturdy silver strongbox. Then sponged off his brow and both burly arms, his massive neck and shaggy chest, pulled on a shirt and grasped a heavy staff. Hephaestus left his forge and hobbled on. Handmaids ran to attend their master, and cast in gold all but a match for living. All cast in gold but a match for living, breathing girls. Intelligence fills their hearts, voice and strength their frames. From the deathless gods they've learned their works of hand. They rushed to support the lord as he went bustling on, and lurching nearer to Thetis, took his polished seat, reached over to clutch her hand, and spoke her name. Thetis of the flowing robes, what brings you to our house? A beloved, honored friend, but it's been too long. Your visit's much too rare. Tell me what's on your mind. I'm eager to do it. Whatever I can do... Whatever can be done, but Thetis burst into tears, her voice swelling. <gasps> oh, Hephaestus, who of all the goddesses on Olympus, who has borne such weathering sorrows in her heart? <laughs> so much pain as Zeus has given me above all others. Me, out of all of the daughters of the sea, he chose to yoke to a, mo yoke to a mortal man. Peleus, son of Achaeus, who and I endured his bed. A mortal's bed, resting with all my, resisting with all my will. And now he lies in the halls, broken with grisly age, but my griefs are worse. Remember, Zeus also gave me a son to bear and breed the splendor of heroes, and he shot up like a young branch, a fine tree I reared him, the orchard's crowning glory, but only to send him off in the beaked ships to Troy to battle Trojans. Never again will I embrace him, striding home through the doors of Peleus' house. As long as I have him here with me, still alive, looking into the sunlight, he is racked with anguish. I go to his side. Nothing I can do can help him. Nothing. That girl the sons of Achaea picked out for his prize, right from the grasp of mighty Agamemnon, he tore her. And grief 
and grief for her has been gnawing at his heart. But the Trojans pinned the Achaeans tight against their sterns. They gave them no way out, and the Argive warlords begged my son to help. They named and full the troves of glittering gifts they'd sent his way. But at that point, he refused to beat disaster off. Refused himself, that is. But he buckled his own armor around Patroclus, sent him into battle with the army at his back, and all day long they fought at the Scaean gates. The very day they would have stormed the city too if Apollo had not killed Menotius's gallant son as he laid the Trojans low. Apollo cut him down among the champions there and handed Hector glory. So now I come, I throw myself at your knees, please help me, give my son, he won't last long, a shield and a helmet and tooled greaves with ankle straps and armor for his chest, and that he was not, all that he had was lost, lost when the Trojans killed his steadfast friend, now he lies on the ground, his heart is breaking, and the famous crippled smith replied, courage. Anguish for that armor. Sweep it from your mind. If only I could hide him away from pain and death. That day is his, that day his grim destiny comes to take Achilles. As surely as glorious armor shall be his armor that any man the any man in the world of men will marvel at through all the years to come. Whatever sees its splendor, whoever sees its splendor. With that, he left her there and made for his bellows, turning them on the fire, commanding work to work. And the bellows, all twenty, blew on the crucibles, breathing with all the degrees of shooting fiery heat as the god hurried on. A blast for the heavy work, a quick breath for the light, a and all precisely gauged to the god of fire's wish at the pace of the work in hand. Bronze he flung in the blaze, tough durable bronze and tin and priceless gold and silver and then planting the huge anvil upon his block he gripped his mighty hammer in one hand and gripped his uh, tongs at first Hephaestus makes a great and massive shield blazoning well wrought embers across its emblems across its surface raising a rim around it glittering Tri uh, triple ply with a silver shield strap that ran edge from edge from edge to edge and five layers of metal to build the shield itself. And across its vast expanse, with all his craft and cunning, the god creates a world of gorgeous immortal work. There he made the earth, and there the sky, and the sea, and the inexhaustible blazing sun, and the moon rounding full, and there the constellations, and on the crown, the heavens, the Pleiades, and the hydras, Orion and all his power too, and the great bear that mankind also calls the wagon. She wheels on her axis, always fixed, watching the hunter, and she alone is denied a plunge into the ocean's bath. And he forged on... I have no idea what that little bit was about. That was weird. And he forged on the shield two noble cities filled with mortal men. With weddings and wedding feasts in one and under glowing torches, they brought forth the brides from the women's chamber, marching them through the streets while choir on choir the wedding song rose high and the young men came dancing, whirling round in rings and among them flutes and harps kept up their stirring call. Women rushed to the doors and each stood moved with wonder, and the people massed, streaming into the marketplace where a quarrel had broken out, and two men struggled over the blood price for a kinsman just murdered. What a wedding. One declaimed in public, vowing payment in full. The other spurned him. He would not take a thing, so both men pressed for a judge to cut the knot. The crowds cheered on both. They took both sides, but heralds held them back as the city elders sat on polished stone benches, forming a sacred circle, grasping in the hands of the staff of cider of clear voiced heralds and each leapt to his feet to please the case to plead the case in turn two bars of solid gold shone on the ground before them a prize for the judge who'd speak the straightest verdict what does this have to do with a face just making armor did i skip a page No, and he forged on the shield two noble cities filled with mortal men and weddings. So this this debate in front of a judge with the bars of gold and the women and the man killed and the blood money. 
that's like that's just stuff that's happening on the shield on achilles's cool shield but circling the other city can they're just describing the shield in like detail in super detail as if it's really happening but circling the other city camped a, div a divided army gleaming in battle gear and two plans split their ranks to plunder the city or share the riches with its people hordes the handsome citadel stored within its depths but the people were not surrendering not at all they armed for a raid hoping to break the siege loving wives and innocent children standing guard on the ramparts flanks by elders bent with age as men marched out to war Ares and Pallas led them both burnished gold gold the attire they adorned and great magnificent in their armor gods for the world looming up in their brilliance towering over troops and once they'd reached the perfect spot for attack a watering place where all the herds collected there they crouched wrapped in glowing bronze detached from the ranks two scouts took up their posts the eyes of the army waiting to spot a convoy the enemy's flocks the crooked horned cattle coming come they did quickly two shepherds behind them plying their hearts out on their pipes treachery never crossed their minds but the soldiers saw them rushed them off cut off a stroke of uh, the herd of oxen and sleek sheep flocks glistening silver gray and killed the herdsmen too now the besiegers soon as they heard the uproar burst from the cattle as they debated huddled in council mourned at one behind their racing teams rode hard to the rescue arrived at once lining up for the assault both armies battled it out along the river banks they raked each other with hurtling bronze tipped spears and strife and havoc plunged in the fight and violent death now seizing a man alive with fresh wounds now one unhurt now hauling a dead man through the slaughter by the heels and cloak on her back stained red with human blood so they clashed and fought like living breathing men grappling each other's corpses dragging off the dead and he fought a fallow f and he forged a fallow field broad rich plowland tilled for the third time and across it crews of plowmen wheeled their teams driving them up and back and soon as they'd reached the end strip moving into the turn a man would run up quickly and hand them a cup of honeyed mellow wine and the crews would turn back up down along the furrows pressing again to reach the end of the deep fallowed field and the earth churning black behind them like a earth churning solid gold as it was uh that was the wonder of Hephaestus's work his work is so good we're gonna dedicate two pages to the descriptions of what is happening as if it's actually a live action thing happening, as if it's actually running around. My God. Can you believe this shit? Just a quick little quesadilla break, if you don't mind. Just a little side thingy. Excellent. Okay. Maybe we can get on from the work. And he forged a king's estate where harvesters labored, reaping the ripe grain. 
swinging the I mean I guess this is called the shield of Achilles. We might be spending the next two pages, the next four pages describing the shield and he forged a king's estate where the harvesters labored, reaping the ripe grain, swinging their wetted scythes. Some stalks fell in line with the reapers row on row, the others sheaf binder, the and others the sheaf binders girded round with ropes, three binders standing over the sheaves. Behind them, boys gathered up the cuts of swath, filling their arms, supplying grain to the binders, endless bundles, and there in the midst, the king, scepter in hand, at the head of the reaping rows, stood tall in silence, rejoicing in his heart, and off to the side, bray, um, beneath a spreading oak, the heralds were setting out the harvest feast. They were dressing a great ox they had slaughtered, while attendant women poured out barley generous glistening handfuls strewn for the reaper's midday meal and he forged a thriving vineyard loaded with clusters bunches of lustrous grapes and gold ripping deep purple and climbing vines shot up on a silver vine poles and around it he cut a ditch in dark blue enamel and round the ditch he stacked a fence in tin and one lone footpath led toward the vineyard and down its pier uh pecks Peckers ran whenever they went to strip at the vine. <clears throat> what? And one lone footpath led toward the vineyard, and down it the pickers ran whenever they went to strip the grapes at vintage. Girls and boys, their hearts leaping in innocence, bearing away the sweet ripe fruit in wicker baskets, and there among them a young boy plucked his lyre, so clear it could break the heart with a longing, and with and what he sang was a dirge for the dying year, lovely, his fine voice rising and falling low as the rest flowed, all together, frisking and singing, shouting their dancing footsteps beating out the time, and he forged on the shield a hair, a herd of longhorn cattle, working the bulls and beaten gold and tin, lowering loud and rumbling out in the farmyard's dung to pasture along a rippling stream. Along the swaying reeds, the golden droves kept the herd in line, four and all with dogs, with nine dogs at their heels and paws flickering quickly. A savage roar, a crashing attack, and a pair of ramping lions had seized a bull from the cattle's front rakes. He bellowed out as they drove him off in agony. Packs of dogs and the young herdsmen rushed out to help, but the lions ripping open the hide of the hedge of the huge bull were gulping down the guts and the black pooling blood while the herdsmen yelled and the fast packed on. No use. The hound shrank from glistening teeth in the lions. They bulked, hunching close, barking, cringing away, and the famous crippled smith forged a meadow deep in the shaded glen were shimmering flocks to graze, with shepherds st steading well-roofed huts and sheepfolds, and the crippled smith brought all his art to bear on a daring circle, on a dancing circle, broad as the circle Daedalus once laid out on Knossos's spacious fields for Aradine, the girl with lustrous hair. Here, young boys and girls, beauties courted with co costly gifts of oxen, danced and danced, linking their arms, gripping each other's wrists, and the girl wore robes of linen, light and flowing, and the boys were fine-spun tunics robed of old gloss of oil, and the girls were crowned with blooms of fresh garlands. The boys swung golden daggers hung on their silver belts, and now they would run in rings on skilled feet, nimbly, quickly, as they as a crouching potter spins his wheel, palming it smoothly, giving it practice twirls to see it run. And now they would run in rows, in rows, crisscrossing rows, rupturous dancing. A breathless crowd stood round them, struck with joy, and through them a pair of tumblers dashed and sprang, whirling and leaping handsprings, leading on the dance. And he forged the open ridge river, the ocean river's mighty power, girdling round the outmost rim of the welded industry destructible shield. And once the god had made the great and massive shield, he made Achilles a breastplate brighter than gleaming fire. He made him a sturdy helmet to fit the fighter's temples. Beautiful, burnished work, and raised its golden crest, and made him greaves of flexing, pliant tin. Now, when the famous crippled smith had finished off that grand array of armor, lifting it in his arms, he laid it at the feet of Achilles' mother, Theseus. And down she flashed like a hawk from snowy Mount Olympus, bearing the brilliant gear. 
the god of fire's gift. What a shield. There's an audio desync. Oh no. Woo! The next book is book 19, The Champion Arms for Battle. But that will have to wait for another week. We're getting near the end, boys and girls. Champion arms for battle. So I bet the next chapter is just Achilles getting dressed. It's like, it's a show, right? He puts on his boots. Then he puts on his greaves. Then he puts on his skirt. Then he puts on his breastplate. Then he puts on his shield. Then he puts on his gloves. Then he puts on his helmet. Then he puts on his spear. Then he puts on his... You know, it's going to be one of them chapters. I can feel it in my bones. I don't know. Um, and then maybe the chapter after that, Achilles goes mad and slaughters everybody. And if you know, I mean, spoilers for a 3000 year old book, but Achilles dies. So he's got to go slaughter a bunch of people and then he's got to die. Then they got to do the whole Trojan horse thing. And then they got to sack Troy and we got... I don't know a third of the book left or a quarter of the book left it's hard to tell so it'll be good <laughs> i mean i know the story is like 3000 years old or 2500 years old or something i still feel bad for for spoils spoilers achilles dies i hope you all knew that ahead of time although it's been a hot minute since I've read it. I also thought this book started with the stealing of Helen from Agamemnon, but it didn't start with the stealing of Helen. We started like 10 years into the war already, or maybe not 10 years into the war, but, you know, in the war already we started um, where they're arguing over loot. No, but he definitely dies here. I don't know. We'll get to it. We'll figure it out. Um... That's going to do it for the Iliad today. We'll be back next week, hopefully, with more Iliad. It's on the calendar, but you, you know how reliable.